Hi everyone and welcome to my channel and welcome to my first video ever. I'm not gonna lie, I'm like super nervous. I think I've did this intro about five times already, but my name is Carol, if you're new here. And in this channel, I'm gonna talk about true crime and I'm also gonna do my makeup while I do it. You're probably seeing the videos like this from Bailey Sarian, from um, Danielle... I forgot to pronounce her name. Danielle Kirstia. It's not even that a hard name. Oh God, okay, I'm so sorry, but um, again, I'm kind of nervous, but uh, those two ladies, they have uh, have channels where they talk about true crime or just interesting stories and they do their makeup while talking about the story itself. And I thought that would be a great idea just because I love doing makeup and I do love true crime. And if you want to skip to the actual case, I'll put like a little time card so you can skip to the story, but I'm going to give a little intro since this is my first video. And there will be a little bit of rumbling in the beginning, I think. But I've always enjoyed true crime. Since I was growing up, I was watching a lot of documentaries, um, reading stuff online about it. And I, even that I wanted to be a forensic um, scientist when I was growing up. But that dream got crushed by my family in so many ways. And I kind of appreciate that because as much as I am very interested in true crime and behavioral psychology and just what makes someone tick to do the very bad things that they do. Um, I can look at those pictures for a long time or just, you know, be there. So I appreciate that I did not go into that career. And in 2023, I wanted to work on a channel that I could do something different. Um, if you don't know, I have an ASMR channel, which I love and I intend to continue doing it, to continue working on it, but I wanted something that would broaden my creati creativity a little bit more and i've been working from home since mid 2023 and i haven't had time to do a lot of makeup since i work from home i don't feel like i want to get dressed if that makes sense um i feel like a lot of people that um, work from home have that feeling so i thought you know what i'm gonna I already searched these cases. I'm already super interested in everything that um, I've been researching about. So you know what? Why don't I just do this so I, maybe I can get on um, putting on makeup again. And just, it's more like a self-care in a way. All that to say that welcome to my channel and I'm going to talk about true crime and I'm going to do my makeup um, at the same time. And these videos are going to come out every two weeks just because in the beginning, it's going to take me some time to figure out a schedule and just to do research. These cases are very um, gruesome and they can be very intense. So I want to make sure that I'm actually doing the research correctly and I'm doing justice for the victims. So thank you so much for being a part of this journey with me. And let's get on to today's case. So today's case is about um, Catherine Knight from Australia. And I did not know about this case before. Um, I actually found out about it a few weeks ago because I don't remember how I found out about it. Um, I was researching some things. Uh, honestly, it probably was just a Wikipedia rabbit hole. But I found out about it that she was the first woman um, to ever be sentenced to life in prison in Australia. So I thought it was super cool and I wanted to research what she did. And oh boy, she she did she did some not really nice stuff. But before we talk about Catherine, we need to talk about her parents, Barbara and Ken Knight. So Catherine's mom, Barbara, um, her name was Barbara Rugon. I think I'm pronounced, pronouncing that right. She was married to a guy named Jack beforehand and they have four kids. They were living in a in Aberdeen at the time, and it's a very small community in Aberdeen, everyone kind of knew each other. And let's just say, Catherine kind of decided that she didn't really want to have a relationship with Jack anymore, so she cheated on Jack with his co-worker, Ken, Ken Knight. She cheated on her husband, Jack, with the guy called Ken Knight, which was his co-worker, and Oops, that's a lot of great start. But pretty much, um, Barbara ended up cheating on her husband with his co-worker. And since the village that they used to live in, the town itself was very conservative, that was a massive scandal for the town. And they had to move to another town 
And Catherine had four kids with Jack at the time. Two of the youngest kids went to their aunt to live with them, and the two oldest kids uh, went uh, kept living with Jack at the time. So Catherine kind of just left her kids there and went to live another life with Ken, mother of the year, as you can see. Barbara and Ken moved to another town called Maury, and in October 24th, 1955, they uh, Barbara gave, gave birth to two daughters. Catherine and Joy Knight. Let's just say Catherine, um, home life was not the best. Ken used to be a uh, alcoholic. He was very abusive towards her mom. Um, there are cases which were kind of proven that he used to sexually abuse her mom about ten times a day. And let's just say Catherine did not um, had the best examples of a healthy relationship when she was growing up. There were also um, reports that Catherine's mom, Barbara, kind of just used to tell her kid everything that went on in her relationship. Um, everything that her dad liked to do, um, what her dad did to her, and that's so messed up. In 1959, um, Barbara's ex-husband, Jack, ended up passing, and the two kids that were living with him, Catherine's two older brothers, had to move with the new family way back when. And they did not really like Catherine. They were also very sexually abusive towards her. Um, Catherine said that they ended up abusing her up until she was 14 years old, which is honestly super tragic. So her home life was not the best, it was not the happiest. And uh, the only person that Catherine really, really liked was her uncle Oscar. Oscar was a ex-champion of horsemen, I guess you want to say. There's a word for it, but I can't really remember right now. But he used to win a lot of awards for being a horseman. And uh, Catherine used to love horses. She used to go to the farm and her uncle used to let her take care of the horses, pet the horses. And in a way, he taught her how to love something unconditionally. You know, without having to abuse it, without having to um, manipulate it. Her love for animals was so big back then that she started taking care of wooden birds and bringing them to her bedroom to take care of them. But her dad, Ken, found out about it and she he really did not like that. So Catherine was able to convince her uncle Oscar to come and pick up the birds so he could take care of them. But that was not a good... Um, memory for Catherine because the only thing that she used to care about was not allowed in her home. So her home life was a roller coaster as you can see and it got much much worse because in 1969 Oscar committed um, suicide. So Catherine was by herself. She only had uh, her dad who was abusive towards her, um, her brothers who were sexually abusing her. And her mom, he, who used to just use Catherine as a therapist in a way, and that wasn't good for Catherine. After her uncle passed, that was kind of a little bit like a switch on Catherine because she did not want to take anything from her brothers anymore. Every time that one of her brothers came to sexually abuse her or just physically abuse her, um, she used to go to her mom and tell her about what was happening. Her mom just used to say, well, you know, it's easier if you just let them do what they want because then they don't, they don't end up like annoying you. So boys will be boys, kind of like that. When she was 15, after her um, uncle was gone, she did not take anything anymore. Um, one of her brothers, the youngest one, tried to abuse her again, to put his hands on her and she just decked him. She just punched him in the face. So the death of her uncle was a big, big thing for Catherine. Um, and in, when she was 15, which was when she, her uncle passed, the, move, the family moved back to Aberdeen and Catherine decided to leave school. She quit. She was not going to school anymore. And the reports on school for her was that she was a really model um, student. She was very smart. She was very charming. She was very nice when she wanted to be. The moment that anyone, any of the students end up crossing her, she would get into fights. She would just punch the other students. She would just talk back. So 
she didn't really have a lot of friends. And I guess she didn't see a reason for her to keep being in school. So she ended up quitting school when she was 15 years old. And she couldn't read or write back then. But that's okay. She, Because she wanted to work at a slaughterhouse. Catherine's dream job was working at a slaughterhouse. And then just um, kind of like channeling her anger and everything that happened to her into the dead animals. So she used to chopped up organs, chopped off um, skin from dead animals in the slaughterhouse. And that was the dream for her. So she was very, very happy when she got it. Catherine was quickly promoted in the slaughterhouse. Um, she started doing just boning, I guess. I'm not really sure what it is and I don't really want to search to know what it is, but she started doing boning and then she was promoted to doing um, skinning of animals or vice versa. So she was, she was a model worker, I'd say like that. She was amazing at that job. She got a set of knives that she ended up putting above her bed every night because she just loved looking at them. And when people asked her, like, why do you have this set of knives above your bed? And she said, well, you never know when you're gonna need one, which honestly, fair. Like I wouldn't put above my bed, but you know, you never know. In 1973, um, Catherine met her co-worker, David Kellett. So Kellett was her co-worker in the slaughterhouse and he was the perfect quote-unquote match for Catherine. He used to love how to drink like Catherine. He used to be great at, great at bar. That's not, that's not really a thing, but he used to um, be part of a lot of altercations, like physical altercations. He was a, like a little bit of a hothead and it, Catherine just used to go with him. If he was in a bar fight, she would go, she would be over there backing him up. So they was kind of like love at first sight, you know, we're Bonnie and Clyde Wade, I guess. They end up marrying in 1974 and apparently David was in highly intoxicated. They end up marrying Mary in a courthouse. Her mom even kind of, um, and that was funny, her mom kind of let him know about it. She did um, let her son-in-law know that her daughter had a, as her, she says, a, a screw loose somewhere over there. But David apparently didn't listen to it or he was highly drunk. I'm not really sure. I don't I don't know when she told him that. Sources say that was the day of the wedding. But I don't know. So they end up getting married. And the day of, of their nuptials, let's just say that after three times doing the deed, David fell asleep because it was, he was highly intoxicated um he had a long day of getting married they end up doing having intercourse for uh, three times and he fell asleep and catherine was not having it she started strangling him in the middle of the wedding night in the middle of the like the room that they were at and he was not oh that's a lot of blush okay well, where are we waking you with it so the reason why catherine decided to do that i guess is because she grew up kind of listening to her mom say how many times her dad wanted to um, have sex, pretty much. And she did not believe that her new husband fell asleep at, fell asleep after having sex only three times when her dad used to um, go for her mom about like 10 times a day. So as you can see, her growing up was not the healthiest. She just did not... Um, had the best examples of a healthy couple. So she decided to strangle her new husband, I guess. And the marriage itself was also a very violent one. Um, Catherine was very, very, very jealous throughout the whole relationship. Every time that David ended up um, showing up a little bit later than he normally used to for work, she would just go crazy. There was one time where she, when she just burned all his clothes and just yelling at him, just saying that he's cheating on her, like where he is he at, but yada, yada, yada. It was a very abusive um, relationship, both sides. Maybe mostly on her, not sure, but both, they, they were not good together. Even so that one day, um, David was supposed to be home at a certain time and he was a little bit later because he was in a darting competition. And she just 
went crazy. That's when she decided to burn his clothes. She burned his clothes, and when he arrived home, he hit, she hit him with a frying pan. Great, very cartoonish. And he ended up st stumbling down to the neighbors, and that's when they called the 911. Um, they called the cops. But Catherine was able to kind of talk to him and then make him drop the charges, and then they were back at it again. However, the couple didn't stay happy or together for too long because in 1976, a few months after Catherine gave birth to their first daughter, David decided to skedaddle. He found another woman and then he just ran away with the other woman and they said, you know, Catherine, you, you do you, you, you be by yourself. And then he was gone. However, Catherine, like I said, was very jealous. She was not happy about this. So the next day after Catherine finds out that her husband left her with a newborn to go have a new life with a new person way out of where they live is that is to just thrash a stroller down the street with her tiny little baby inside. And people saw that and they were not really happy about it. So they saw it, they called the cops and Catherine was escorted out to the psychiatric facility, the hospital close by where she was evaluated and uh, was discharged with some meds after a few weeks. So everything seems fine, right? So Catherine had a mental breakdown, everything's fine. She got the treatment she needed and everything was a-okay, right? Catherine stayed at the hospital for several weeks before she was released with postnatal depression and medication for it. The day after that, she decided to pick up her baby and put it, she put the baby in, it's a daughter, by the way. I just, I'm trying not to say the, the kid's name because they're probably alive and I don't want them to get backlash for it. But um, she decided to put her baby, super young, super newborn, into the rail tracks before the train came by so the baby would die and end up getting an axe and going into town and threatening to kill a bunch of people. Someone was able to find the baby before anything bad happened, so that was good. And the police was able to get her while she was going crazy in town and put her under arrest. And then after again to the psychiatric um, facility like she was before, but she was able to check herself out like the day after. So, you know, don't know why that was a good idea. Like it's the second time she's there. So who thought that would be a good idea that she could just be like, yeah, I'm good. Let me, let me out. I won't do anything bad. Narrator, she did something bad. So days passed by, but Catherine is still much, very much in love or obsessed with David and still not happy that he went to Queensland to be with his, to live with his new wife there or girlfriend, whatever. And so she decides to get a knife and then threaten someone on the street, a family, slash a woman's cheek and demand her that she is taken to Queensland in the family's car. The woman obviously says yes, because you know, crazy person with a knife, I'm going to do what you tell me. But they are able to convince Catherine to stop at a, at a service area, probably just to put gas or something. And, so, and someone's able to kind of run away, call the cops, and the cops come by. They are able to grab Catherine, put her, actually arrest her, and everything is fine. So she does not end up going to Queensland. She does tell the police that her plan was to kill the mechanic that fixed David's car because by fixing his car, he was allowed to leave, which is a weird, weird logic. But okay. And she said that he, she wanted also to kill David and David's mom. Now, when David hears that, he's like, think of, like he's in Queensland. He he has a new side piece, woman, whatever. He has a relationship going on. And when he hears that, he decides to drop everything. He brings his mom back to Aberdeen to be with Catherine because that is great thinking and so he goes over there he gets the baby bag and he releases Catherine and the cat Catherine is in the care of her mother-in-law and her ex-husband or husband at the time it doesn't really mention if they get divorced or not and everything seems fine which honestly just seems very weird but everything seems fine until it's not they end up having another daughter in 1980 but in 1984 
Catherine is just done with David. So she decides that she does not want to deal with him anymore. And then she just leaves him. And she meets someone else, another David, in 1986. Catherine met David Saunders in 1986. He was about, he was a 38 year old minor. She wasn't with um, Khaled anymore, the other David. And Saunders had two other kids already and he had another apartment as well. And the relationship between him and Catherine, which as like every relationship with Catherine, there, there was very, there was a lot of abuse happening. Catherine was very jealous of everything that David was doing. She was not happy that he was like doing stuff without her. He ended up, she ended up cutting his clothes multiple times. There was a lot of verbal and physical abuse, according to sources. Even so that... One day, Catherine decided to... And there's actual evidence of her talking about this in an interview, if you want to find it. I watched uh, 2020... Was it 2020? No, I watched a documentary on YouTube. I can, I can link it down below if you guys want to know more about the story where she talks about what she did, which was getting his new puppy. He just had a new brand new puppy and she was just so jealous and so angry that he was not home, that he wasn't doing anything. She just slashed the puppy's throat because reasons. And she just talked about it like nothing happened. Like, oh yeah, just, you know slash his throat he throws that's fine anyways she was not it was not a good relationship most of the like all the relationships that Catherine has they're not good relationships so but for some reason saunders decided to stay with her um and his breaking point was pretty much after they had their their kid so Catherine first uh, third daughter at the time after having their kid they end up buying a house together the house apparently was full of skulls animal skin um a lot of dead animal everything, I guess. That's the way Catherine liked to decorate the house. David's breaking point was when they were having another heated ar argument. Catherine punch punches him in the face and then decides to stab his chest. That was the breaking point for David. He decides, after that, he decides to go into hiding. To, he's scared of his life because he they did buy a house together. But David had um his older apartment still so he just decides to go into hiding which honestly very very smart for him let's be honest here but the kick is that he goes into hiding for a few months um Catherine is crazy because she is again super upset that he's gone super angry that he just decided to leave her by herself just inconsolable he stays there for a few months and when he decides to show up again because he wants to see his kid because, you know, they have a kid together, they have a daughter, he finds out that she actually has a restraining order against him and the kid. and Like, she and the kid has a restraining order against him because he, according to her, was abusive towards them. So he cannot go visit his kid anymore. So he goes back into hiding. In 1990, um, Catherine gives birth to a, a boy and because she was in a relationship with another co-worker called John Chillingworth, Chillingsworth, Chillingworth, I believe that's how you pronounce his name. And the, the relationships did not last a long time and there's not a lot of details about it. They only lasted about three years because she ended up cheating on her current partner with the victim of today's case who is John Price. John Pricey Price was 43 years old when Catherine met him. He was liked by everyone. He was also a minor. So Catherine also definitely had like a uh, type with the people that she used to look out for. He was a minor. He was bulky. He um, was more scruffy, I guess, if, if, if you want to say it. But everyone loved John Price. John was kind to everyone i guess he he used to like be a drinking buddy to a lot of people john was also divorced he got divorced in 1988 and he had two kids that lived with him and he used to love his kids so much and you have even interviews with the kids nowadays talking about um their dad and you can see how much they love 
um, their dad. So it's kind of great to just know that they had that kind of relationship. So John was aware of Cat Catherine's violent past, but he still let her move in with him and his two kids. And everything seems fine for a long, long, long time. But in 1998, Catherine started getting upset because John would not, um, would not commit. He would not marry Catherine. And you know, that's, it was his prerogative and he just did not want to marry Catherine because she was too old to have a baby, I guess. that I think that was her ideas because every other partner that she had, she had to get pregnant to kind of maintain the relationship. Because if you notice that every time she got pregnant was after things were end up getting stale or she was getting bored or they were um, not I'm getting interested in, in her anymore. So she did not want to lose John. So she wanted to get married. And then John did not want to get married. He was divorced. And honestly, that's fine. Marriage can be very, 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 very much of a hassle. And he didn't want to. But she was not happy with it. So when they had this discussion that she wanted to get married, he did not want to get married, she decided to get revenge on him. And she decided to film a bunch of things from his work that he used to steal and then send the tape to his boss, which made him lose his job. Honestly, that's some type of evil. I don't even know. I'm saying don't steal stuff from your office. Just if you don't need to, but like, ooh. Anyways. So, you know, obviously after doing what she did, Price kicked Catherine out of his house because he didn't want to have anything more to do with her. You know, she made him lose his job, so it's completely justified that she doesn't live with him anymore. But honestly, it was only after a few months. I don't know what happened, but they were back together. Price took her back in, metaphorically. He did not let her uh, move back in into their uh, his apartment. Smart idea. Not the smartest that you have, but smart idea. And... Life was good. She didn't really mention getting married again. And it, it was okay for a little bit. So the arguments that they had, it started growing more frequent. They ended up arguing way more than they used to. It was just not the best. And so much so that one time, Catherine ended up stabbing Price in the chest and that day was when price was done he did not want to deal with Catherine stuff anymore so he kicked her out again and he decided that he was going to get a restraining order against her but the, the day that he went to the police to get the restraining order which i think was the day after um he ended up getting stabbed and uh, the police said that they needed to wait a few days because it wasn't like that so he went back to work. He told his co-workers what had happened. He showed the bruise and he said, if I died, if something happens to me, know that was Catherine. And the co-workers was like, were like, hey, maybe you should not go back home. And he said, no, everything will be fine. I'm just going to go back home. So after his shift, he goes back home. And that's the day that the things in this case happened. Kind of trying to see what can I say, like without giving too much away so when bryce got, gets home he doesn't see catherine but he also does not see his kids and he finds out later that um catherine kind of actually sent the kids for a sleepover in like in another place um she i think she just left a note for him letting him know what happened so he went to his room and decided to take a nap um catherine shows up a, a few hours later he's still sleeping and she decides to go watch some tv she goes watch some tv after that she decides to wake price up the next morning though um price's co-workers are getting worried about him because he's not showing up for work price's neighbors notice that his car is still in the park in the driveway and he never is late for work he never misses a day of work and time goes by nothing so a few co-workers decide to go by to do a quote-unquote wellness check so they go over there they open the they knocked on the door and nothing they decide to see if they can open a 
a window or something. They call the police. They knock. They break the door down. I cannot think of the door. They break the door down and they find Price's um, body on the floor, very, very disturbed in a way that I'm going to get into it. And next to him is Catherine's body on the floor with a bottle of pills open next to her, which looks like she committed suicide. So the first thing the police notices, and actually there's a lot of first thing the police, the first thing that the police notices, well, actually there's like a lot of quote unquote first things that the police notice. But one of the first things that police notice is that Price doesn't really seem to have a head. Um, it seems like his head got decapitated somehow. And he doesn't really have skin. Like he has no skin. Like is it, it's his body. Because like you can see it's a body, but it's not. There's no skin there, and they find that one very, very gruesome, and just odd. So they start going around the house to see what else they can find. And in the meantime, um, Catherine is taken to the hospital to get checked, and then she's taken to the police station eventually. So what the police find is Price's skin hanging from a hook. Uh, a meat hook close by, which according to the officers at the time, it didn't even look like skin because they didn't know what it was. It just looks like leather, which again, could not be a forensic scientist. But they decided to keep looking and in the kitchen, they noticed there's two set of plates um, with some potatoes, some meat, some vegetables, and two set of cards, one for each um, Price's kids, one for each daughter, I guess. And in on top of the stove, there's a pot, and they open the pot to see Price's head being cooked there. The autopsy results end up revealing a horrible, gruesome, um, turn of events for that night in specific. It shows that Catherine actually stabbed Price about 37 times the night, skinned him, cut parts of his meat, cooked part of, it, part of his meat, and was gonna feed said meat to his kids without telling them that it was their dad. Which honestly is disgusting. So, um, like, like I said, I did do some research in this case. I watched some of the officers um, talking about the day when they actually were in the crime scene, and a lot of them had to go through therapy because it was disgusting and it was ter like it was a thing of nightmares just to see that type of violence. Something that they you don't really see every day as a policeman, and it was just very disturbing, which I can totally understand. So the autopsy showed that Catherine definitely killed Price. And then after she did all the things that she did, it is said that she tried to eat him, but it seems like she wasn't able to because they did find a third plate inside the oven, I believe. Which, I guess, why didn't you just throw it out? I don't know. But um, it's, it said that after she did everything, after murdering Price, after, after skinning him, um, cooking parts of his body and doing everything that she did, she took a bunch of pills and passed out next to him. And that's when the police found them. However, comma, um, she says she doesn't remember anything. So she was taken back to the police into custody. They were interviewing her and her defense is that she does not remember blackout here. So Catherine's defense was amnesia and disassociation, which honestly, I don't believe it, but I, I do believe as an actual um, defense. I do think she was fully sane when she, was, when she did the things that she did, but I understand the logic of someone else having amnesia and disassociation, 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 disassociation when something traumatic happens, especially because she had such a god awful childhood. Um, someone like that, I understand, just not knowing what you did. But at the same time, she wasn't just she didn't just get grabbed a gun and shot at someone. She 
stabbed him 37 times. She decided to skinny him. She did everything consciously. She knew what she was doing. That's what I want to say. And it was proven later that after she murdered Price, she went to his ATM to withdraw about a thousand dollars from his account. So again, it shows that she knew what she was doing. So her defense was not the best in my opinion. And I, I, I'm i fine with it because I really don't like her. Catherine also stated that um, John used to abuse her daughter and but nothing was proven out of there. So I don't know if that's true. There was a lot of, there was a lot of back and forth during the trial of, of her saying X, Y, and Z. And it's funny because she pled it in the pleading guilty, which honestly with those charges and all the evidence that she had, I not surprised she pled guilty. When I went the forensics or one of the police that were there, I don't remember who, but when they were talking about the crime and what actually happened, um, apparently she got hysterical in the middle of the court. She started screaming, she was trashing, she had to be sedated. And I just find that, um, so rude, you know? So in 2001, which is crazy because that's just 20 years ago ish, I guess. And th this crime seems like something from the 70s and 80s that, because that's when um, everything bad was happening. But in 2001, Catherine Knight was sentenced to life in prison for her gruesome crime. And she was the first person, well, the first woman to be sentenced to life in prison in Australia, which good for everyone else. The thing is, she still does not want to take responsibility for the things that happened. And even though like they did bring in psychologists to test her to make sure she was sane and they said that they, she was, she's still saying that she doesn't remember anything that happened. And I don't know if that's a good um, defense or not, but she's sticking to her story. So what do you think of the story of Catherine Knight? Again, I just found out about the story a few weeks ago, so I did not know anything about it before going into it. But it is a crazy case, especially just for the gruesome and the disturbing details, just how cold you need to be to kill someone 37 times, just stab them 37 times, and then go on to doing the other things you did. And then you have a plan for his kids. It's just, it's a lot. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope you stay with me here in the channel in this new adventure with true crime. I did... I should have said this in the beginning of the video, but I totally do not. Um, I'm not a makeup artist, so whatever you see that happens on my face, I guess, ow, on my face is not like professional. Like, I just like playing with makeup. There's nothing, like, I, I've never taken a class. I've never done anything. So, like, do not use this as a technique. Like, I normally do not even know what, what I'm going to do with my face. Like, what eyeshadows I'm going to put or anything like that before sitting down. So... Yeah, <laughs> again, I'm just really happy that I'm doing this. I am very excited. I'm very nervous just because I want to do right for the victims, right for the stories. And yeah, if you have any case that you'd like me to cover, please let me know down below. I'm always interested in finding out new stories and let me know how you, how you doing. Let me know how you doing. Okay, bye.